I'll, I'll share my mic too, because if, uh, if you guys start start arguing passionately, it would be a shame to have to one at a time. <laughs> so welcome, Ted Hope and Hal Hartley, to the podcast. Thanks, Adam. Great to be here. <laughs> great to have you. Likewise, Adam. Yeah, great to have you. Yeah. So Hal, we did it, and it was during the I think your Kickstarter, because yeah, that I, would I, that did then all make sense. I knew I met people. But it w- you made your uh, mm. all your money, you, right? You, you reached your your goal. and I'm almost okay now. I'm almost over it. I, I think just f- as a fan, you know, to just be able to see work that may not otherwise have gotten made now get made is just – it. W- people think about it as funding, but it's ultimately, I think – fans, the audience now having a say in what culture gets made, that's just damn exciting to me. Oh, uh, yeah, because I wasn't even, <laughs> now I get two mics, I wasn't even, I was thinking one thing that comes up in almost every show, because I almost, invariably every other show I have somebody doing a Kickstarter, I have a lot of filmmakers, a lot of filmmakers that are, you know, trying to c- figure out how to navigate making a career out of this, and a lot of them are doing, you know, of course, Kickstarter campaigns, uh, or other, I should say, funding. Crowd, that's a better way of putting it. Crowdsourcing. Crowdsource mm-hmm. fundraising. And one other thing that comes up every time is that you're also building this community out there of supporters and of ambassadors for your film. So that way, by the time the film hopefully is, is made, you've already got people out there creating a larger uh, support group and network of, uh, of you know, fans and potential audience members. So it's a great thing. I think when Very you powerful. think how uh, it used to be that a film could only really be marketed through a, either a film festival or maybe those six weeks leading up to its theatrical release. You know, I had people asking me, you know, will Hal be showing the trailer for, for Ned Rifle mm-hmm. at My America? Like, you know, th- there's an awareness in the core group now of what people are doing where it feels like it's their movie. It may be a Hal Hartley film. They have a stake in it. Yeah, but they know that, that they helped make it happen. That, that he somehow managed to give me, like an incredibly stingy person, get me to give like more money than I've ever given on a, on a crowdfunded campaign. That somehow like him pleading that he's about to drop off convinced me to like bankroll to the extent that I did. It's, Man. That doesn't get you a producer credit either, by the way. No. Are, are, are you a producer He's on the He's got one of those are anyway. You? Okay, good. A couple of them. <laughs> yeah. How many – let me ask you a question because I wasn't positive. I heard you upstairs. We are, by the way, to take a little s- tiny step backward. We're at the IFC Center right now recording this in their green room. And uh, r- during the screening of My America, which is uh, directed by Hal Hartley, it's a one-off screening. It's currently on Fandor. It premiered on Fandor on – uh, appropriately on, on July 4th. And um, it, how many times have you guys collaborated? I believe this is our 11th film, but it's the first time that we've collaborated where uh, I'm not a producer of any sort, where I'm the distributor. So, it, you know, it may count, it may count less. And I, I guess in some ways you could argue that if you well, go out. It's interesting because I r- remember even this early, well, amateur flirt, we used to have these conversations where you would take the lead in these, of, of course, given your ambitions were you're like producing and distributing have got to stop being separate things. You, that's how you used to talk back then. And, you know, it was really helpful. It's always stayed with me. And it has something to do with why I have always been um, – as proactive as I have been on remarketing my films and what you were saying before. I was teasing Hal earlier in that, you know, he's one of the only um, artists that I know of who have dreams of being a businessman. You know, many many a businessman is dream- are dreaming of, you know, writing that book of poetry or painting that masterpiece or finishing that novel. You know, Hal has, uh, s- you know, film by film, you know, put together a, a business structure that supports him on one side as the creative process supports him on the, the other. Yeah. 
maybe not quite in the maybe not quite in the uh, no no uh, in in the cut style that he'd like to be accustomed to. But yeah, it's uh, is that the possible films uh, that the how you built that up and what what it's doing the production your production company is called Possible Films, right? What 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 is it? Has it's reached a, a certain level of the of, uh, of successfully of this vision you had for what how you wanted well, yeah, to I make mean, movies, create find an audience or ha, a, or create a, a way for audiences to f- find you, which now is also being helped by Fandor. Well, I mean, Possible Films is my employer. I am okay. the sole employee <laughs> of Possible Films, and my job each day is apart from you know writing and developing projects and directing and all that is to mm-hmm. take care of my films um, because um, I mean perhaps a lot of uh, younger filmmakers might need to be reminded of this is that when you make a film it just doesn't have this one life in its first year you know it's it's a product that can no matter how art artful and obscure and weird it might be um, it's a widget? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it can be monetized indefinitely. So uh, I, a part of my work every day is to look after the monetization of my creative output. If, if I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. So, but I think this is one thing that's so exciting about this moment in that when Hal and I started making films together, you made a movie – and it went out theatrically, and then a while later it would show up on DVD, and maybe it would end up on television. The type of films we made, it was very rare that that would happen even on cable, but I remember being thrilled one time when I was in L.A., and I turned on the Z channel and Trust was on. I was like, that was one of those moments where it felt like, oh, my God, I made it. (laughs) It's on TV. But you didn't have that ability to access everything everywhere at any time on any platform as or a device as a, as, a as a fan oh. as a fan and as, or as a creator you didn't have that access of getting another so it changes the dialogue i think and it starts to change the way we interact with with art and one of the things that i find exciting about a platform like fandor is uh people when they're interested in how's work can dive in deep and see a wide variety of stuff and those people can enter dialogue with each other and hopefully we'll be able to provide even more and more context you'll be able to access this podcast 10 years from now when you know you're showing the love of your life that the my america and you want greater uh context into what went into the movie you'll be able to access that like now we the business goes from being just a creator or a producer of individual products films right to somebody who manages a ongoing relationship or conversation with a community right that's what possible films in my vision right not i'm not his business partner <laughs> when i look at it possible films is that it's where you can go in and have more of that dialogue that's the vision i certainly have for fandor where it's like you you could enter the 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 world of hartley or the world of bellatar or the the, the world uh, claire the in, of claire Denis or anyone right you know like that they're all there and hopefully you have deeper and deeper context where you can go as deep as you like or just skim as little as you like. I have always thought that in a lot of us types, certainly, you know, and we have different kind of skills and stuff like that, but there's a library. We have this inner librarian I've always had. And uh, what you've just been describing is something like that. Like for me, when I make work, any a short film, a feature, a theater piece, music, whatever. To me, I'm contributing to this library, uh, and you know they all. Ha- each piece of the library, each section needs to talk to the other, and I've because I've always felt that that's really exciting. I, you know, I'm a big Who fan, so you know it's really exciting to me to realize like, wow, these pieces of Who's Next were actually written for this other thing that Townsend had in mind, but he didn't do. And you know, and, and it's interesting to see, like, wow, you know, these, th- this 
like 16 measure bit of this song was is actually also in this other album and this other song mm. Mm. Um, oh i see yeah like it inter i i got th there's a uh great book out uh now by astra taylor called the people's platform you will be very inspired by it, Hal, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. And uh, Astra is a filmmaker, too, did, did um, an examined documentary, Examined Life, and uh, one on Zizak. And, and, this, and the book kind of talks about the, the, what the promise of the Internet was and what the reality and how things might better serve both fans and, and artists themselves. And in it, there's a discussion with Jem Cohen, a uh, filmmaker we both know and uh, whose work we like and who's actually on Fandor. And uh, he speaks about a, of a double anchor, the, the need for um, you know both artists and audiences to be able to work together and to get away from this place where we might feel we want free content um, and recognize that we vote with our dollars for the culture that we want. And he's somebody who very much has a archivist approach to creation oh, the way right? he man the way he creates his pieces is yeah. Yeah. and in speaking to him i got all ex in reading that book i got all excited in a vision of i would like fandor to for a group of directors who we have direct relationships with to be able to become the digital archive of their work they're free to go anytime but the more stuff that they put in, we will organize it for them. We will be their librarian, and they will be able to, to utilize that. And in an ideal world, you start to marry that with something like crowdfunding so it can be preserved, maintained, and utilized. And those people who help support that have certain unique privileges or benefits that come from it. But the, thi the nice thing that's been happening, you see it with, with Fandor and elsewhere, is the cost of memory, you know, of, of that digitization has just been dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. When Hal and I first started using an Avid, you know, like the memory bricks were huge. Just like those. Yeah, and cost, not, cost a fortune and held nothing, right? And now they're tiny, you know, cost nothing and hold the world, you know? And so the potential of being able to say to a filmmaker, let, you know, give us every contract that you have every piece of film you ever shot, all of your outtakes, let us organize that for you, put that together, you control what's public and private, you know, and we'll house it, and you're free to go anytime you want. Does this uh, model operate outside of the world of, of the Hollywood thing, which has a very different uh, idea of how to run a business and how to do, do their business? Um, I've heard of you, Hollywood. <laughs> you, <laughs> well, you just you've just come English? off of doing this series, I believe. Maybe you still have more episodes of, of reinventing Hollywood, right? But I, I mean, it's all about marketing dollars in that in that in that space. Whereas what we're talking about is a very different thing. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier we're here while your film, My America, is going on, and these are m how many monologues? Twenty one. Twenty one. Twenty one monologues, all written by different playwrights, celebrating. I'm not sure that's the right indeed. word. Not yeah, the right it's, word. it's it's no, it's not celebrating. I guess the investigating in, investigating the topic of 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 race and of of well, class no, in what is, where is it, wh America it, it, or where is America? That was interesting. Kwame insisted on that. It's, it's like it's what is my America? Asking yes. the writers, what is my America, or where is my America? And that was interesting. If he only asks, what is my America? it would have turned out to be a, a really different collection of mm. pieces. But the introduction of where, uh, and some of them really, it, there's a spatial dimension, uh, and even a kind of a psychological spatial dimension to the way some of them uh, addressed it. I definitely found, you know, you talk about like what are the narrative engines, and any time that there's a omnibus feature, and you've made one, before um you you have this you know each piece talks to the next and you're kind of comparing and contrasting right. that was a and, large part of putting this together yeah. and one of the puzzles i found in watching the movie is like okay where's this one set you know where is it what part of the country yeah. where is this coming from it. it's in the yeah. text yeah or sometimes even in just the performer's attitude you, know? you could have an infographic 
<laughs> of the yeah. co- of the of the country of where uh but it had, it had um it, but it's interesting how many at least of the ones we see because I think there were more that were commissioned for this project right that didn't make it into your film right there were there 50 were. commissioned and they were all made as separate little pieces uh-huh. that were used for various kinds of uh fundraising for the center stage theater yeah uh they showed them in the, the lobby of the theater they showed them around town it was a real kind of community kind mm-hmm. of thing uh, and then I I responded to 21 of them that I thought would make, you know, a sensible 75-minute kind of entertainment that, like Ted just uh, referenced, how they talk to each other. While I was editing these 50, I, w- I began... T- there were some that were absolutely excellent pieces, beautiful writing, but tremendous performance. I, you know, I even did some good work in there. And some of them, but they were just too particular. You know, I needed right. to... S- skew to the more general and there were certain things it was really hard for instance these were all shot in 2012 so gay marriage was a really big issue and four of the pieces of the 50 address gay marriage because um, you didn't have when you went into this conversation uh, when you went into these conversations with these playwrights or I didn't you didn't do it no it was center stage I didn't have any Central Stage Central Stage Company Center Stage Center Stage I'm sorry Center Stage Company out of Maryland uh they did this. This was their project. You yeah. shot. They commissioned shot mm-hmm. the writing and they cast it. Okay. And, and they I didn't. Just, ha- I just put it on. Camera. Okay. But anyway, this thing about like there was four of the fifty were about gay marriage, and they just didn't really address it like broadly enough. It was like too specific at uh, the time. And but however, there was one small piece, Mark. Marcus Gardley's piece, where, which was really about black men in a white society, which had the same actor doing three different kind of black men, a young black man, a black preacher, and I forget what the other one was. But the black preacher one had this excellent addressing of the gay marriage thing. Uh, so I asked him, Marcus, can I cut away the other stuff and just use this because it's it's crucial i mean this is what yeah. the, this is part of what the country's beating itself up about right now so uh, you know so he said yes and that was good so yeah i had to i had to look around and pull things out but yeah i was really skewing much more than i i do in my own writing skewing for the most general i wanted the most general ec- or easily recognizable issues that the country the nation as a culture was going through at the moment. You know, it's funny for for me looking at it, you know, I, I give a lot of advice to young filmmakers, how should they deal with the times that we're living in as an artist and establishing their career. And one of the um, pieces of advice I give over and over again is, you know, to recognize that this is a era of abundance. We're not living in a time of scarcity of stories and content. We're overwhelmed, right? 50,000 feature films a year produced globally. Well, the only sane thing to do as a creative person looking to connect with an audience is actually to be ubiquitous, prolific, and radically collaborative, right? When I think of like an American auteur, how I see, you know, I look it up in the dictionary and I see, you know, Hal's, you know, silhouette, <laughs> the tall, thin man, and uh, they're not quite so thin anymore. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the uh, but, you know, I think this is so representative of it, right, uh, of the, the need to do that. And then the second piece that I often give is you have to look for shared values that kind of transcend your own audience, right, that other people have. And I think the nature of this project hits all of those bases. Like it, it, it is a radically collaborative project. It's not a tour cinema. This is the first film that Hal isn't, that isn't a film by Hal Hartley. That is simply a directed by. He's worked with a whole bunch of folks. He found a, a large-scale, collaborative, creative platform, which is really hard to find in the, this, this era. And in the nature of what it is, it has a whole wide range of values ju- statements in it that allow it to be utilized 
you know, that allows its utility to be surfaced in different ways for different groups, different communities, and different audiences. It fits that dynamic perfectly. It's why we had to have it on Fandor. Good, I was going to ask you. Uh, it, wh how does this fit in? How does it fit in with your other work? In that, I mean, and then how did it come about? <coughs> uh, as as you were crowdsourcing for Ned Rifle. Well, this happened <coughs> way <coughs> way before the Ned Rifle thing. This happened back in 2012. I was approached by my friend Susanna Gellert, who was at that time a producer of Center Stage, um, and Kwame Kwai Armar, who's the artistic director. Uh, had come up with this idea. Interestingly, he's an Englishman, uh, <laughs> an Afro-English uh, person, right. okay. um, who had, uh, who's a, a playwright and an actor in his own right, who had been given this position at uh, Center Stage, and it was one of his ideas when he became, now he's living in America, and he wanted to know about So America. this was a literal question, and you t or you took it very literally. And and said, "I'm going to direct this thing and answer your question." Now no, he, no, I know he was. He, he did all the commissioning himself. He commissioned all these writers. Gotcha. Yeah, these uh, fifteen. Mm -hmm. This was it, right. So, so he, I should say, he, he, he had the question, and so he decided to do something about it. Yeah, so yeah. it was personal. Gotcha. It right. had a Very personal, personal kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, personal and broad, of course, and because he knew he would get fifty different voices, you know, coming at it. Uh, and then he brought me on, and we sorted through the scripts. And uh, he was very concerned at the time about whether it was too dark when he read them all. He was like, is this too, like, anti or you know, whatever? And my, my take on it, at, in the aggregate, all 50 of them, I thought, well, it's, I don't say it's dark. I, I, it is not celebratory, you mm -hmm. know, it's, uh, but it's refreshing. Because it's frank. in the aggregate, it's frank, and people aren't looking away. Most of these writers decided to look really at the situation and the situation of being Americans mm -hmm. um, in this day and age, uh, individually and as a nation. So I mean, it's, it's like I found that really refreshing, and I thought one way or the other, it would be affirmative. Somehow it would be affirmative, even the most pissed off pieces ended with a kind of sigh of anguish you know was there a a time limit or like a, a there were word parameters count? That they were supposed to be three no longer than three minutes which like nobody <laughs> no uh some of them were 15 minutes long and those were the ones that i didn't um you know by some pretty big playwrights in america who i won't name but i mean they they were just too long I did my best with them, but I mean, this was, I mean, I had $20,000 to do the entire thing. Wow. With, and that meant, you know, rental of space, hiring a crew, whatever. So, you know, and so some of them, you know, if they were 10, 15 minutes long, there was just no way we could really do justice to the text, even if the text was great, you know. Mm. Um, what, watching it for, for me, I I think it could give birth to to a curriculum in that I would love to see film schools, theater schools, writing schools, colleges of all liberal arts colleges do that as an assignment. Like I I would, you know, love to see both the professional and the amateur, right? Of what that would expose, like the, you know, let your chains set you free, may the Constraints oh, exposed. Sure. That's, exposed. Always, that's yeah. always a good one. That's what we did in Flirt. I mean, that's exactly what Flirt was. You know, to just say tell the same story in three, the same story in three different cultural contexts and mm -hmm. three different. But um, Fl just for th for those that don't know, Flirt was a uh, film that Hal and I did together. That was essentially the same script, uh, but altered for New York, Berlin, and Japan. In some ways, uh, Hal's gift to me on it was I actually, though I had produced several movies, I had never raised uh, money for a film before. And I think he just, as a lark, was like, well, t Ted wants to raise money for a film. I'll give him something nobody can raise money for. Like, good luck, Ted, you know, selling the same movie three times. 
but it, it worked and we actually got the money and we got off to uh berlin and tokyo and yeah. and uh hal fell in love even and actually everybody there. everybody's on oh, that yeah, movie that was a big love fest everybody That's over the course we had a shooter over the course of a year everyone's life had changed by the time we were done yeah we all found wives some of us, for some of us it was a curse Not my present life. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the clearing that up. Wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to, accidentally start something. I was going to ask you. If, I know you did a bunch of shorts that kind of were similar in the sense of n different topics and whatever you wrote. You wrote them, right? You did monologues and, and some shorts that feel like that. Maybe they I were dialogues. Okay. Like that, I've done they felt okay. Shorts. Yeah. Maybe some of them felt very theatrical in that way, but that's kind of reminiscent of your features as well. So this kind of fits in, you know. I guess. <laughs> I was the man. Well, I I find it really interesting that we still live in such a, in terms of a filmmaker's body of work, it seems to generally fall into these buckets of feature work or maybe television work, and ca occasionally, and you yeah, know that I will change. Yeah. Is that I, what you're getting yeah, at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. D d d jump the shark, you know, like... Oh, you I'm know. just, you know, I'm just yeah. noticing, like, Louis C.K., you know, his television show. Like, he made one, you know, that's like an hour and 15 minutes. Right. When it's generally, like, 25 minutes long. And he said, no, I'm just going to... Like, you can do that now. There's yeah, no especially if you have a following. Technically, like technically and, VHX. and commercially, there's no reason to uh, circumscribe the, right. the time. The feature film form is an economic model. That which was, was based on the theatrical model back in the day. Which I mean is the, based on the size of the human bladder and the, s and the size like of the stomach. You know, those, those two and, and blood going to one's ass. And supper and stuff yeah. like that. But, but I think it's interesting. You, know, you also see filmmakers like the Safdie brothers and the Duplass brothers. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, who who continue to make shorts, and to me, what it's representative of, when I think you see someone doing it, it's someone who actually is concerned about or interested in the craft, the art, you know, being generative and doing that. And we haven't until now, I think, actually started to have the beginning, the semblance of an economic model that can be built off of that. And that's part of what online cinema is about, that those pieces have a home. And, and they, they allow stories that might be contained within a narrative. Like when Hal and I first started working together, one of the things Hal wanted to do was to own his characters. We would license the movies, but those characters were Hal's, right? So, right? so that they could live in other movies. Like in the beginning, some of those characters can, you know, yeah, enter characters each other's... from the Unbelievable Truth showed up in Simple Man. And stuff like yeah. That. Another example of where your, 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 your internal universe you've created, where they can interact and the films can interact. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, because I know we have to wind down here for part one of our conversation. <laughs> just kidding. Um, and that is... We should do, like, we should, we should uh, do this like boyhood. And, uh, you know, do a new yeah. piece every 12 years. <laughs> I'm game. Every How? You in? years from now, I hope to be a novelist living in, like... Paris again? Or yeah, somewhere. Um, well, I just want to mention, uh, uh, okay, so you can see uh, uh, My America right now on Fandor. Ted, you've got a, you got a, a book coming out, Hope for Film, titles based on your blog. It, that's coming out August 12th, available for, for pre-order now, I assume. And just... We'll plug that. And what's Have the and what's to read it? You get Parker there you to read go. Hope for oh, film. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. put it on Fandor. <laughs> and 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 Ned Rifle. What's the uh, Ned, the prognosis the on Ned Rifle? Is that it's almost done. Okay. Weeks away. Uh, we're from uh, very like positive Earth. about the fall. The world will see it and hear about it in the fall. Okay, that's great. And, and as soon as this podcast is over, yeah. I'm going to make a blind offer of bucket load of cash to Hal and even throw in the first beer tonight at the bar for it if he'll let us stream it stream it exclusively on fan I think we can do it right on the air right on the podcast <laughs> sorry all right so you'll come back for that for in the the theatrical or whatever or streaming and stream thank you both very much it's an honor to have you both okay, yeah. and thank, thank you, you.